Hello, Matthews Gatos here. Welcome to Chapter 11, Permutations, Combinations, and the Binomial Theorem. In this video, we will be covering 11.1 .1 permutations in Part 1. Let's talk about what a permutation is. It's really called an arrangement. So here's an example of a question that involves permutations. How many possible outcomes are there for a coin that's tossed four times? Well, you could list them all out and count them, or you could use a tree diagram to help you. So tree diagrams have branches, and then once you're done all your branches, you have all your outcomes, which you would just list and then count how many. So if I have four coins, I have four branches. So you can see four different coins, four different sets of branches. So each time it branches off into two choices, heads or tails, every single time, two branches, heads or tails. So if we follow a path, for example, here, heads, 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 and heads, that would be my first outcome. Well, if I were to do that for all of them, listing them all out and counting them up, there would be 16 different outcomes. So what I'd like to know is, sometimes I don't want to list out all the outcomes, I just want to know how many there are. So I want to count how many there are by using what's called the fundamental counting principle. So here's how this works. If there are m ways of performing one task, n ways of performing a second task, then altogether there are m times n ways. So that a coin example that we just did, where we listed out all the outcomes, counted them all up, found that they were 16, could be done using the fundamental counting principle. Since there's four coins, instead of having four branches, I have four dashes. And I'm going to look at the number of options for each coin. So two choices for the first coin, heads or tails, two for the second, two for the third, and you guessed it, two for the fourth. So two times two times two, fundamental counting principle tells us to multiply 16 different outcomes. So we know that it works. So this idea of listing out the dashes and labeling underneath them is going to be your key to success with the fundamental counting principle. And I'll model that in each question that I do, starting with this one. So in this library, we have barcodes on all the books. Now the barcodes have 14 digits. The first eight always have to be 3184700, but the last six can be any digit. So first thing you need to know is that digits, single digit numbers, there are 10 of them, zero through nine. So when we look at our number of choices, we're going to look at the first has to be this number here, and then I have six digits that follow. So only one choice, it has to start with that. Then the next one could be 10 choices, and then 10 choices, and then you guessed it, 10 all the way along, okay? So fundamental counting principle tells us to multiply all those together. And you can see when you do that, there are 1 million different barcodes that are possible. Let's try another example. This was actually a diploma example. So let's say you look at the seating chart of a plane. Well, all the black seats are not available. They're taken. All the gray seats are open. So let's say there are 12 seats available and there's seven customers that want to book a seat. How many different ways could I assign seven customers into one of 12 seats? Well, again, let's look at our number of choices. We have seven customers, so seven dashes. Now, this first customer looks at the seating chart and has 12 seats to choose, and they choose one. Then the next customer comes. They can't choose what customer one chose. They have 11 choices. Then customer three says, okay, well, I can't choose one or two, what they chose. I have 10 choices. Notice it goes down by one each time. So this will be nine, eight, seven, six to follow. Goes down by one as each customer picks their seat. Fundamental counting principle tells us to multiply all those together. And this is unbelievable to me. 12 seats, seven people, look at this. 3,991,680 different ways they could assign a seat. That's unbelievable to me. Let's try another one. So let's say we have a manager of a perhaps camping store. Wants to do an ad for the tents that they have available. They have three yellows, a red, and a blue. So they set up the ad, but they don't want any yellow tent to be next to another yellow tent in the ad. 
So they want to separate the yellow tents with the other ones. We want to know how many ways that can happen. So you can see there are five tents. So I'm going to start with that. Five different tents. So yellow, the second yellow, the third yellow, and then the other one is red, blue, and the other one is whatever the first one wasn't. So if this was a red, this had to be a blue. If this was a blue, this has to be a red. So three choices for my first yellow tent, two choices for my second, and only one choice remaining. Over here for the red blue, two choices here, and then after I choose it, only one choice remains there. Multiply all those together and I get 12 possible outcomes. So you can see by placing restrictions, there are less possibilities or arrangements. Let's look at some number questions. Okay, so we have a bank machine pin, like what you enter in when you purchase something debit without tapping, or if you wanted to take out money. That's what I'm talking about. I want to know how many four-digit pins are possible. Well, you can see I have two questions. My first one is, can a four-digit pin start with zero? The answer, yes, it can. A pin is not a number. My second question, can a four-digit pin have repeats? Answer, yes, it can have repeats. And in fact, repetition in any question is always allowed unless otherwise stated. So let's look at our number of choices. So I have four digits, four dashes. So for the first digit here, I have 10 choices. The second digit, 10 choices. In fact, each one of these has 10 choices. So multiplying all those together, I can see that there are 10,000 four-digit pins that are possible. Well, let's put some restrictions on that. This time I want to know how many four-digit pins are there that start with a nine and have no repeats. So this one here is a little bit more limited. So let's go ahead and look at the number of choices. So I have to start with a nine, but I'm not allowed any repeats. So this is where I'm saying, this is your key, labeling the dashes. This one has to be a nine. This can be anything but the first. This can be anything but the first or the second. This can be anything except the first, second, or third. So let's go ahead and fill those out. One choice has to be a nine. This one here can be anything except for the first. So since there's 10 digits, I take away the first digit, there's nine choices left. This can be anything except for the first or the second. So again, 10 choices, take away the two restrictions, eight choices. Here, there are three restrictions. So 10 take away three is seven. And actually my tip here is, for each of those dashes, I look at the total number of choices minus the number of restrictions. Now, of course, fundamental counting principle tells us to multiply those together. So I can see there are 504 different four digit bank codes that start with a nine and have no repeats. Now let's add on another layer of complexity. How many four digit bank codes have at least three threes? Well, let's look at that word at least. At least means a minimum. So it could have three threes or it could have four threes. So let's look at our number of choices. So we could have three threes or four threes. Let's get this going. There we are. Okay, three threes or four threes. So I don't know I have three threes. You can see there's one choice for all the threes. The thing that really I have to focus on is the not three. So there are nine digits that are not three. The reason I have four cases is because I don't know where the not three digit is. Is it going to be the first, the second, the third, or the fourth? That's why I have four different cases. But in fact, each case will be similar. So three, there's only one choice for all the threes. There's only one choice, it has to be a three. For the not threes, there will always be nine choices. So nine choices for all of them. So for each one of these, one times one times one times nine is nine. So I have nine plus nine plus nine plus nine, or nine times nine, which is 36, nine times, sorry, four, which is 36. In this other case, I could have four threes. So one choice for that, one choice for that, one choice for all of them. So if I multiply one and one and one and one together, I just get one. So 36 choices for the first one, one choice for the second. 
what do we do with this word or? Well, or in math means add. So I add those two together. There are 37 four-digit bank codes that have at least three trees. Okay, let's move away from bank codes and towards numbers. So I want to know how many four-digit odd numbers are there with no repeats. So my first question, there's no repeats, is can a four-digit number start with zero? So think of any four digit number. Can it start with zero? Like zero, one, two, three. Is that a four digit number? Zero, one, two, three is just 123. So no, if it did start with a zero, it would be a three digit number. Now we have four digit numbers with no repeats. So we have no repeats. We can't start with zero, but let's talk about this odd numbers. Odd numbers end in odd digits. So we've got a couple restrictions going on here. So the way that I label my dashes is going to be super important. So four dashes, because I have four digits. Look at the detail that I label these with. I want you to do the same. The first one can't be zero and it can't be the last because the last has to be odd. Okay, so there's only five choices for that one. Here, this can't be zero or the last. This digit can't be the first or the last. This can't be the first, second, or the last. So labeling all of those. So here there are five choices, or you can look at it as 10 choices take away the five evens. You're left with five odd. Over here, there's two restrictions. So 10 digits take away two restrictions, eight choices. Here, I also have two restrictions. 10 take away two, eight choices. Now you might wonder, why are those two the same? Why are they both eight? And the reason is, this one can't be zero, but it could be zero here. So zero goes back in the mix. That's why those are the same. So here, three restrictions, 10 take away three is seven. Again, fundamental counting principle tells us to multiply those together. So there are 2,240 four-digit odd numbers with no repeat. So the last example I want to end with is one where we're going to be talking about grouping and positioning and the not case. So let's look at that. So I want to know how many ways Alice, Bob, Kathy, Don, and Edward, A, B, C, D, E, can line up for a picture if Alice and Bob want to be on the ends. Okay, so again, let's look at the number of choices. So looking at this, Alice and Bob have to be on the ends. So see Alice and Bob, Alice and Bob. So if Alice is here, it can only be Bob. If Bob is here, it can only be Alice. And then I just have three different people left to arrange in the middle. So Alice or Bob, two choices for the first. Only one choice for the left, last, whoever I didn't choose. And then three people left to arrange. So that's just going to be three, two, one. So putting that into my calculator, I can see there are 12 ways of arranging five people if Alice and Bob have to be on the ends. Now, let's say Alice and Bob, it's all about Alice and Bob in this question. They're a little difficult. Here they have to be on the ends. In the next question, well, they have to sit together. So what we're going to do to make this easier is group Alice and Bob as though they were one person. So now I'm going to take it as though there are only four people to arrange. So looking at this, first spot, second spot, third spot, fourth spot, four people to arrange. So that's just going to be four times three, times two, times one. But as you can see here, I've said there's two ways of grouping Alice and Bob. It could be Alice and Bob or Bob and Alice. So I'm going to take the four, three, two, one ways of arranging four people and multiply it by the two ways of arranging Alice and Bob. So four, three, two, one for the four people and times by two because it could be Alice and Bob or Bob and Alice means there are 48 ways that Alice and Bob must sit together. Now Alice and Bob are going to be even more difficult and they're going to say, I'm sorry, we can't sit together now. So how many ways are there if they sit separate? This, oh my gosh, there's so many cases. Look, if Alice was here, Bob could be third, fourth, or fifth. But let's say Alice wanted to sit second. Well, then Bob could be fourth or fifth. It goes on and on and on. There are so many cases, too many to calculate. So what we're going to do is look at it in a simpler way. There's really only two cases. Either they sit together or they don't sit together. 
So my advice to you in math and also in life is to stay positive. Let's focus on the positive. So if those are only two cases, I'm just going to look at all of the ways with no restrictions, take out all the ways they can sit together, and then I will be left with all the ways they can't. So let's look at that. All of the ways to arrange five people with no restrictions. Well, five people. Five times four. There we are. Times three times two times one. 120 ways of arranging five people with no restrictions. Now, all the ways Alice and Bob can sit together, we've already done that. That was our answer in B. That's 48 ways. Subtract those two, and there are 72 ways they can't sit together. So let's summarize our video here. Repetition, always allowed unless otherwise stated. Always start with your restrictions. Really be detailed when you label your dashes. At least is a minimum, at most is a maximum. Group objects together as one item and then arrange them, but pay attention to the ways that I can group them together. Always stay positive. Never solve a can't question. Solve an all minus can equals can't question. And if you ever have cases, or means add. So the last question I want to end with in this lesson is, how many monsters are good at math? The answer, none, unless you count Dracula. You guys can move along to the practice questions in my notes, numbers one through six. Detailed solutions are on D2L, and then move on to the textbook questions as needed. So I hope this video helped, and I look forward to seeing you for the next one.